In this video, I'm going to summarize the typical sequence of processing steps, beginning with the raw EEG data that come out of the recording system and going all the way to the point of measuring the amplitudes or latencies of the ERP components. You've already heard about most of these steps, but now I want to put them in order. Different studies do these steps in different orders. If you want to know more about the order of steps, take a look at this web page. I'll keep using Felix's aversive conditioning study as an example. To keep things simple, I'll focus on the late positive potential. He also looked at the skin conductance response and a long duration ERP component called the stimulus preceding negativity, but I'll skip those. As a reminder, subjects saw a CS plus color that predicted the occurrence of a loud noise burst, and they saw two different CS minus colors that predicted the absence of the noise. Felix predicted that the CS plus would elicit a large LPP, which reflects emotional arousal. Felix recorded from 27 scalp electrodes, and he also recorded from horizontal and vertical EOG electrodes. These signals were recorded in single-ended mode, which just means that the referencing was done in software offline. Felix used the average of the mastoids as the reference. The signals were digitized at 1000 Hz, which means that there was one sample every millisecond. An anti-aliasing filter was applied in hardware prior to sampling to make sure that the sampling rate was more than twice as high as the highest frequency in the data. Felix resampled the data offline to 250 Hz. That just made the data files smaller and the processing faster. A high-pass filter was then applied that filtered out signals below 0.1 Hz. That just gets rid of slow voltage drifts that mainly come from the skin. Felix then applied ICA artifact correction to subtract away voltages from blinks and small eye movements. And then he used artifact rejection to throw out the small number of trials that had other kinds of artifacts. The next step was to extract fixed duration epochs, time locked to each CS stimulus. Felix used a 1000 millisecond epoch that included a 200 millisecond pre-stimulus baseline period. He then combined all the CS plus epochs together into one average, and all the CS minus epochs into another average. The two different CS minus stimuli were just averaged together. Remember, the hypothesis was that the late positive potential would be larger for the CS plus than for the CS minus. Feels like I've been telling you about the methods for this study for hours. Now I can finally show you the results. As predicted, the LPP was larger for the CS plus color than for the CS minus colors. The CS plus waveform shown here is from the 50% of trials on which the CS plus wasn't followed by a noise burst, the CS plus US minus trials. But the same thing was found on the CS plus US plus trials. Felix also found a larger skin conductance response for the CS plus, but the response of the skin was delayed for several seconds. The LPP result shows the actual time course of the brain's emotional arousal response to the CS plus. Felix also made a difference wave to show the time course of the brain's differential response to CS plus versus CS minus. This difference wave can't exceed zero until the brain has determined whether or not a given stimulus is associated with the noise burst. You can see that this occurs within 300 milliseconds of stimulus onset, even though the noise burst doesn't occur until two and a half seconds later. Here are the scalp distributions. As usual, the LPP was largest at the PZ electrode site. As you'll recall, we don't usually show single subject ERP waveforms in ERP papers. Instead, we take the single subject waveforms and average them together into a grand average. So these are grand average waveforms. But for the statistical analyses, Felix quantified the LPP amplitude from each individual subject's waveform. He did this by measuring the mean amplitude between 350 and 650 milliseconds at the PZ electrode site from each subject's CS plus and CS minus waveforms. Felix was interested in how the emotional response to the stimuli developed over the course of the conditioning procedure, so he broke the data into three blocks of trials. Each block had 16 CS plus trials and 16 CS minus trials. This yielded a 2 by 3 factorial design. Each subject had an LPP amplitude value in each of these six cells. Felix then took the data and entered them into a two-way ANOVA with factors of CS plus CS minus condition and block. The larger LPP amplitude for the CS plus trials than for the CS minus trials led to a significant main effect of condition. Things were pretty stable over blocks, so there was no significant main effect of block or condition by block interaction. You can see these effects here in the CS plus minus CS minus difference scores. The CS plus elicited a larger LPP than the CS minus in all three blocks. By contrast, the skin conductance response habituated over time. 
Subjects also reported their subjective probability of the likelihood that the CS plus would be followed by a noise burst at the end of each block. These subjective reports didn't habituate. In his discussion, Felix noted that he found the same skin conductance effects as previous studies of aversive conditioning, but the effect habituated over blocks. The LPP also showed a significant conditioning effect, but it remained stable over blocks. So did the subjective ratings. So this suggests that the LPP is more closely related to conscious awareness of the probability of shock than the skin conductance response is. Felix's bottom line was that the LPP is a useful measure of aversive conditioning that provides information beyond what you can get from the traditional skin conductance response. This was a pretty simple paper, much simpler than most of the studies from my lab, but hopefully it provided a concrete introduction to what you'll see in the methods and results sections when you read ERP papers.